All right, so I am continuing on just teaching some basic doctrines. Now, what's a little bit different with this basic doctrine or basic truth that, that I'm going to be preaching on, it's actually going to be kind of a series. And it's not a scheduled series or anything like that. I'm just going to keep on doing this. And the doctrine that I'm going to be talking about here is one where we reject all forms of worldliness. That we're called out to be a peculiar people. That we're not supposed to be of this world. Like the Bible says here in verse number 2, the Bible says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what I'm going to be doing in my series, I'm going to be preaching through different doctrines, as it were, all tied into the the same type of thing of being a peculiar people, being someone who is transformed by God's Word, by the Bible. Um, and just to give you an idea here, I'm going to read through. You don't have to turn to these places. You can write down the reference if you'd like. There's a few times the word peculiar is mentioned in the Bible, and it's not in Romans 12, but like in Exodus 19, verse 5, the Bible reads, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice, indeed... And keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. In Deuteronomy 14, 2, the Bible says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Deuteronomy 26, 18 says, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. And then in Psalm 135, verse 4, the Bible says, For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Now you say, well, Pastor Burson, that's the Old Testament. He's talking about the nation of Israel. They're his peculiar people. Well, the New Testament also talks about a peculiar people. And again, I'm not going to go in depth into how we have, uh, as believers today, have kind of replaced the nation of Israel as being God's people. But we are God's chosen people as believers in Jesus Christ, that we are inheritors through Christ. And um, in Titus chapter 2, verse number 14, the Bible says, "...who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself..." a peculiar people zealous of good works." This is talking about people who are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. That God is trying to redeem us from our sin, from iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. It's using that same word, that we're peculiar, be different. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9 says, But ye, and again, 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter, it's not, um, you look at who it's written to, verse number 1, the Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The strangers are not what you would call the, the children of Israel, right? They're foreigners. They're strangers. His epistle is written specifically to foreigners, to people who are not of the seed of Abraham physically. He's talking about other believers who are strangers, who are foreigners. And in 1 Peter 2.9 it says, But ye... You foreigners are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Believers are called to be a peculiar people. Just as... Abraham, the father of faith, as it were, was, was called out to be a peculiar people. And Isaac and Jacob, the children of Israel, they were God's chosen people that he used to give his word through and to. And that was the people who believed on the Lord. That's why he used them. And as children of faith, when they believed in the Lord, he used them greatly and they were called out to be peculiar. Now, the word peculiar is used for people that actually obey God's laws. And we get that from the verses I already mentioned, especially in the Old Testament. He says in Exodus 19, If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure. What makes us peculiar because peculiar just means different, is when you actually start obeying God's laws. 
Now, you could say, in a sense, you're different when you're saved because you have a new creature, a new spirit born inside of you. But if you don't let that manifest itself outwardly, you could just look the same as the rest of the world. And you're not going to be peculiar in anybody's eyes. Okay? And what I'm going to be teaching out with these doctrines are specific issues or items or doctrines that have to do with our outward appearance, what people can see visibly on the outside. Now, intermingled with that, as we continue on week after week, I'm going to be preaching other doctrines, other things that we just believe that it's not necessary as an outward manifestation. But what I'm going to be focusing on this morning, this evening, and then continuing on are multiple things that we believe that should demonstrate themselves outwardly. That if you follow God's word, if you're obeying all of God's commandments, then you will be peculiar in the world's eyes. Now, you can follow some of God's commandments and not be peculiar. For example, thou shalt not kill. Okay, there's nothing peculiar about obeying that commandment. Or you say, well, I'm obeying God's laws. I'm obeying commandments. I'm not killing anybody. Okay, yeah, that's not very peculiar. But as we get into all of God's word and all of his laws and all of his testimonies and all of his statutes, then you start getting into areas where the world's just like, whoa, no, that's weird. And, you know, the world changes. The world's constantly changing. There's, you know, cultures change, values change, morality changes. Even in my short lifetime, my 40 years in this country, morality has changed significantly for the worse. I mean, we've gone way down the tubes. It's, it's incredible how much change can happen in such a short period of time, yet so many people are practically oblivious to it because they just keep getting carried along with the world and just whatever, oh, this is, oh, can you believe that's the way things used to be just 20 years ago? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, but they were believing the same thing. Why? Because so many people just brainwash and just believe whatever it is that media is going to tell them or that the world is going to fill their brain with. Now all of a sudden this is wrong and this is right and this just flip-flopping back and forth and they have no solid source of truth. But we have a solid source of truth. So if you're following all of God's laws and all of his commandments, there's going to be times where different things that you're obeying in God's law are going to be more peculiar than at other times. And some of the things that I'm going to be preaching about today, what I'm going to be starting off with is gender roles. Because I think out of everything, that seems to jump out more than anything else in our gender-bending, sizzified culture today of just of, of this androgynous and trying to get everybody into this unisex thing it's disgusting it's perverted and you know with all the gender pronouns now and people want to be called by the you know it's it's nonsense it's insanity and anymore if you start believing in these in what the god has ordained what god has set forward as far as what men and women should be doing how they should act what their characteristics should be now you're going to be viewed as a peculiar people you're going to be looked on as weird as strange oh what do you mean you, you're not going to use you're not going to call this woman a him you're not going to call the, this fag a she no i'm not going to i'm not Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 2. God had a plan for his creation. Men and women. And we could learn going all the way back to the first book of the Bible... Very quick, you start reading your Bible, you start to see real quick what God has designed for men and women. It's really, really elementary, really basic. It, it, it can't get much more basic than just, I'm a man, what should I do? I'm a woman, what should I do? What, you know, how did you make me, God? What do you want me to do? Look at Genesis chapter 2, first of all, because we need to, look... What I'm going to say it may not, I mean, I don't know if it's popular with this crowd, it probably will be, but it's not popular with the world. And I know everybody's at a different level in your spiritual growth. But you have to decide for yourself, 
Are you going to let God's Word decide what's right and wrong? Or are you going to let this world tell you what's right and wrong? If something I say offends you, you have to ask yourself, is it something that's just my personal opinion that offends you? If that's the case, so be it. Or is it God's Word that offends you? My job as a pastor is to read God's Word and give the meaning. Otherwise, there'd be no purpose for a pastor. You could all just go home and read the Bible. I'm going to make the application. I'm going to help give the meaning for what the Bible's talking about and apply it to today. And this is timeless. What we're going to read right now is timeless. This goes back to when God first just created man at all. We can read Genesis 1, goes through all the creation of the, the animals and the plants and the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth and the seas and everything else. And then we get man being created. And I want to specifically jump here to verse number 18 in Genesis chapter 2 because, of course, you know, man is formed out of the dust of the earth. God breathes, breathes the breath of life into Adam and makes him a living soul. And after he's created man, he's created all these beasts and stuff, he says in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now, it's important to note, though, this, that God created man in his own image. Man is made in the image of God. God made man first. Now, it's not saying that men are better than women because man was made first. That's not what I said. But it's a fact, and it's true, that God made man first and in his image. God is, that's why God, you have God the Father and God the Son, they're, they're, they're male attributes. A father, a son, they're not female, it's not a mother and a daughter. God's image is that that would be of a man. God created man after his own image. But because after he made man, he says, you know what, it's not good that man should just be alone. He says, I will make an help meet for him. Meet just means suitable. And when he creates an help, that means an help. Someone to help him to do his job. God has a job for men. And he says, I want that man to have someone to help him. And one of the things is right off the bat that people get backwards these days. And a lot of wives think that God made the husbands to be a help for them. And that's backwards. It's not what the Bible says. No, ladies, God made you to be a help to your husband, to help him. Now, it's not a sin for husbands to help do things around the house or whatever, but we need to get back to whose jobs are whose. Men's job, and we're going to get into the scripture for this, but men have a responsibility to provide for their household, to pay the way to go off to work. And to support the family. God made men stronger physically, stronger emotionally. He made men and women different. And he designed us for a specific purpose of what we're to do in this life. And for the men, they're supposed to work and provide and love their families. And women were designed as wives to stay home, to rear children, and to, and to obey her husband, and to, to run the household at home. And to be a keeper at home. That's the way that God designed men and women, and to help her husband. Jump down there to verse number 21. When God makes woman. So he says, I make a help meet from him in verse 18. Verse number 21, the Bible says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now this is a great, um, a great truth and I'm not going to get too far in depth into this at all with this sermon. It's a little bit outside the scope but what an amazing thing that when God has created a woman that she is such a perfect help meet that, there, that he made it so that, you know, she was created out of man, out of man's flesh, literally, physically, to then become joined to the man to where those two can become one. And the point of marriage is to become one with each other 
and you essentially should be acting as like one body or as one person. Now one body, a body has one head. There's one person in charge. And again, I'm going to get to these verses a little bit later, but it needs to come out now. And as we keep going, you'll see established from Scripture, from God's Word, that God has established the husband to be the head of the household. If you have two heads, that's not going to work out very well. It's okay if both heads are in agreement on what, what you want the body to do. But if you have one head trying to control this arm and then the other head, like, no, no, I want this to do that. And you got this, this fighting back and forth. Well, if they're both heads, they're both equal. How do you resolve any issues ever if there's going to be a dispute or a problem? Why would anyone's opinion be valued over the other one if, if, two, if there's... You know, in, in the case of man and a woman, both of their decisions are equally just, just established as being ahead. It doesn't make any sense. It's not going to work. There has to be someone that has the final say so, that has the authority. And God has delegated that authority unto the man, unto the husband. Flip over to chapter 3. We're going to see a little bit more about these gender roles, about the role of men and the role of women that has been ordained by God, has been given by God. And this happened now after um, Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. So there's a judgment came upon Adam and Eve as a result of their sin. In verse number 16. Now you, can, you, you don't have to be happy about what happened here in the garden. But you can't change what happened, and you can't change what God said, and you can't change the result of what happened in the Garden of Eden and the result of sin. It is what it is. This is the world that we live in. This is the life we have to live. And these are God's word. Verse number 16, the Bible says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Now, that was one of the curses is that, you know, any woman who's been, who's given birth knows that it's not an easy task. It's why it's called labor. It's difficult. There's sorrow involved. Oftentimes there's crying and screaming and wailing and gnashing of teeth, you know, all, all this stuff that goes on when, when a woman's bringing forth a child. That is one of the curses. But look at this. It doesn't stop there. It says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. If not before then, at least at this point, God said, okay. Now you are going to be in submission to your husband. He's going to rule over you. And he says, your desire is going to be to him. Verse number 17, and he goes to Adam. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, notice that the two things that God has, has cursed them with is what, for the, for the woman, it had to do with childbearing and being in submission to her husband. And for the man, it was the ground and the work. Why? Because he was already expected to do work. Now it's really going to be hard for him. He didn't curse the woman with the ground being, you know, bringing forth uh, all the, the uh, thorns and thistles. He cursed the man with that. Why? Because it's a man's job. And just as much as a man doesn't give birth physically to children, that's why it's the woman's God. God's given that duty unto the woman, and he's cursed her by making that much more difficult and much more laborious and, and much more grievous of a process. Why? Because that is how God created man and women, and that is what we have to live by today. And those are the words of the Lord. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 5. We're going to get into some more uh, teaching here in Ephesians chapter 5 regarding how God views, in this passage, is specifically husbands and wives. So obviously, there are men and women that are not married. Okay? And... Um, we're going to get into that a little bit also on just the, the attributes that men and women should have. Whether you're married or not, that applies to all men and women. But specifically in this chapter, and I think, and again, this is probably one of the biggest problems anyways in our culture. It has to do with marriage. 
The family has been under attack for a long time. Satan knows this. You have a strong family. It's going to be a lot harder to, to sway your family, even morally. But when you start dividing the mom and the dad and the kids and pitting them against each other, you've got no stability anywhere. And it makes it a lot easier to succumb to all the other sins of the world. You've got a strong family. It's going to help you. It's going to help keep you strong just on your day-to-day -day life. Ephesians chapter 5. God relates a husband and a wife on this earth with a husband and a wife, or excuse me, with uh, Jesus Christ and the church. So there's, there's two truths being taught here. One is the relationship with Jesus Christ and the church. And the other one is how with husbands and wives. And um, they're both important. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Very strong statement, very important statement, but this is directed specifically in God's Word to wives saying, Wives, you're, you need to submit yourselves to your husbands, he says, as unto the Lord. You think about how much respect you give to God and how much authority He ought to have in your life, in all of our lives, man and woman. God should have supreme authority in your life. And whatever God says, you say, Yes, God, I'm going to do that. This is the level of submission that is being given to wives in Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, the only time you would contradict that is if your husband is contradicting God's commandments. Because God still has the ultimate authority over all of us. But if your husband is telling you to do something and you don't want to submit, but it's, it's not contradicting God's authority, which is a supreme authority, then you ought to submit to that. Verse number 23, the Bible says, For the husband is the head of the wife. Remember I was talking earlier about there being two heads in a family? No, there's one head. And the Bible is ordained that the husband is the head. The husband is in charge. That's what the head means. It means they're in charge. The husband is the head of the wife, even as, in the same manner that Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Of course, Christ ought to be the leader of any church, of every church. And just as much as he is in charge of that church, that is how much the husband is the head of the wife. Look at verse number 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. Subject means they're submissive. They're, they're obeying. They're in obedience to Christ. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, I know that this can be a hard pill to swallow because the culture today has taught you from birth, in probably almost everybody's case here, that no, 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 sister, you need to, you know, don't let that man tell you what to do. You do your own thing. You've got it, you know, and, and having this type of an attitude, a rebellious attitude, a rebellious heart that says no one can tell you what to do. No one can control you. That's what music's been telling you. That's what the movies have been telling you. That's what the news media has been telling you. Oh, look at this person. Oh, can you believe this guy? And, and they'll always show these really horrible examples of maybe someone who's like, you know, some, some despicable man who just beats on his wife and is just some loser deadbeat scum as you know the example of someone who's telling his wife what to do right that's the example they're going to give you to try to warp your impression warp your understanding of no it's actually biblical and god has ordained that the husband is in charge and that you are to obey in everything and i know the the, the common thoughts are going to be well well, my husband isn't that smart, or my husband isn't that spiritual, or my husband isn't this, or my husband isn't that. And you're going to have all the excuses under the, under the sun to say why you shouldn't obey your husband. But you know what? The Bible still says what it says. And if you want to have a good marriage, I suggest that you obey God's commandments and God's word in getting your marriage to work. You can't control it. At the end of the day, you can't control what your spouse does. You can't. You, 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 you cannot control their actions. But you can control your own. 
Wives, you can't control what your husband does. You can't control how he's going to lead your family. Maybe he's not going to be a great leader, but he is the leader and he is in charge. And it's not your job to judge your husband's decisions on whether or not you think they're the right thing to do, whether or not you're going to choose to obey him just because you disagree with what he says. That's not your place. It's not the way God has ordained it. And likewise, the men, we're going to get on to men in just a minute. God has ordained that the men are to love their wives and not to be bitter against them and, and, and to love them and treat them with honor and respect as under the weaker vessel. And men, you can't control. Maybe your wife isn't being very submissive. Maybe she's not falling in her role that God has ordained, but that doesn't change your job either. You are still to love your wife the way that the Bible outlines. And let's get to that right now. Let's look at this. Verse number, uh, let's keep reading it. Verse number 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Or excuse me, verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That is the level of love that a husband is to have for his wife. That you're willing to lay down your own life for your wife. You're to give of yourself that much for your wife because you love her that much. That's the love you need to have. And you know what? Maybe your wife is stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious, but that doesn't change what the Bible says about your love that you are supposed to have. You're supposed to be willing to lay down your life for your wife. And it says here, you love your wife. Also, verse number 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. He's about Jesus Christ loving the church and giving himself for it. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So Christ wants his church, he wants his bride to be without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, presented, beautiful, great appearance, looking good, clean inside and out. Well, husbands, you ought to love your wives enough to want them to be similar. And that's why as the leader, as the authority... It's okay to establish rules that are going to help your wife to be presentable without spot, without wrinkle, without any such thing. Because as the leader of the house, you are not just the provider, but you are to be the spiritual leader of the house as well. You ought to, be, you ought to know more men. You ought to know more about the Bible and God than your wife does. Don't let her outpace you. If you've got a wife that's spiritual, praise the Lord, that's great. You know, be thankful for that. But you need to, to roll up your sleeves and get in the Word yourself and start doing your own studying and making sure that you know more and staying ahead because you're supposed to be the one that's able to teach your wife. That's your job. And I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't know that this, this feminazi movement is so crazy anyways. Why is it so desirable to be the one that has all the responsibilities and if anything fails, you're the, the buck stops with you? It's not all it's made out to be, I'll tell you what. I mean, God's made men to lead, but at the end of the day, the, the status of the household, you know what falls on? It falls on me. My house, it falls on me. Anything goes wrong with my kids, anything goes wrong at my house, if my wife's not doing what she's supposed to do, if my kids aren't doing what they're supposed to do, at the end of the day, I'm responsible. I need to be up to date. I need to make sure I'm doing a good job, and I need to make sure everyone's provided for. Yes, I make decisions. Yes, I'm the final authority in our household. But it's not, it's not all this big power game. And you know what, guys? If you think that it's all, it's like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to be like sitting on my throne and just telling everyone what to do. And, you know, and, and I'm not going to do anything and everyone's going to serve me. You're not going to lead well at all. And it's not going to work. When you lead your family, you want to lead them well. You lead by example. You be a hard worker. You show love. It's not about being some dictator. It's not the point. But that's the perception, right? That's what the world's going to throw out there is, oh, you're this tyrant. You don't let your wife and kids do anything. No, I'm not a tyrant. 
My family's great. I've got a great marriage. My, my wife loves her job. I love my job. And you know what? You will too if you decide to live your life the way that God has outlined it. Because as the creator of men and women, I think God knows a little bit more even than we do about what's best for us. About what's going to work. He didn't give us these rules to, to cause problems. On the contrary, it's when you go against God's word is when all the problems will start to arise. You want to have a happy marriage? It's right here in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular... So individually... See, and, you know, I think God already knew what a lot of people are going to try to do with these verses. And they're going to try to say, oh, no, no. See, what, what the world's going to do is say, oh, no. You know, all of that was just trying to give you some information about Christ and the church. Right? That, that's all. That's the whole point of that was just, it was, it was only to tell you about Christ and the church. That's not actually how husbands and wives will go. He's just using that as an illustration, but he's really, all he's doing is just telling you about, about Christ and the church. Well, no, that's why it says here in verse 33, nevertheless, he said, even though I'm telling you this great mystery, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, everyone individually, so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Reverence is respect, it's obedience for your husband. So, just so there's no confusion here, let's just make sure that you guys are all doing this in particular, individually, every single one. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to see a little bit of a, a more on a husband's role. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives the qualifications of, of someone that wants to be a bishop, that wants to be a pastor, someone who wants to be a leader of a church. We get these qualifications. Apostle Paul is writing Timothy, and he's telling him, hey, we need to ordain pastors in these churches. Because they went out, they got a lot of people saved, they got people meeting together, they're being taught and trained. But he said, you know what, we need to have pastors here. So he gives them the qualifications. Now, just because these are qualifications for a pastor doesn't mean that you can just ignore that as a man. Say, well, I'm not ever going to be a pastor anyway, so I'm already disqualified. Look, this is what the way God wanted us to be. These are just, this is just like a minimum. These are all part of God's commandments for everybody. And this is just, let's just find someone who's at least meeting these requirements. They'll be acceptable then to be a pastor. That's all that is. It's, it's not like you could just ignore it because you don't want to be a pastor. Verse number 2 in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker. Again, we're not talking about you know, some, some deadbeat husband just you know, beating on his wife. Well, the Bible says here you're not supposed to be a striker. I mean, you're not, you're not going, you're not a brawler, you're not getting into fights. And that's going to mean with your own spouse as well. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Look at verse number four. One that ruleth well his own house. So wait a minute. Who's in charge of the house? Well, according to this, it's the husband. One that ruleth well his own house. He's ruling. He's in charge. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. You know what that means? Is that when dad says something to the kids, the kids are going to give respect or reverence unto the Father and do what He says. Now let me add this. Because it can be really difficult for a father to rule his house well, especially his children, have his children respect him if mom is not respecting her husband. Because you know what the kids see? They see the reality. They see the act. They don't, they don't just only hear they're going to learn by doing. So maybe you have daughters. They're going to see mom. Well, she never listens to what dad has to do. 
And you know what's going to happen a lot more likely? Now the kids are going to think, well, I could just do whatever I want to do because, I mean, she's not listening to them. Why should I listen to them? Now, of course, there is a remedy for that to, to an extent. Obviously, then dads, you need, you need to be chasing your children and making sure that if, that if their wife's not going to obey you, at least they will. And that, that comes in the form of discipline. Spanking. Yes, and we believe in spanking. And that, that's a whole other sermon. I'll get, in, I'll get into that when we get to that. That'll be coming up in a week or two. But yes, it is scriptural. Yes, it is biblical that you don't spare the rod. You command respect from them. But that the Bible says here that you know, the husband should be ruling his own house well and have his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Flip over to chapter 5 there in 1 Timothy chapter 5. That's for the men. Of course, the men should be ruling. And you should be ruling well. Like I said, it's not about being a dictator. It's about being a good leader. And I'll tell you this much. If a, if a husband is loving his wife the way Christ loved the church, it's going to be a lot easier for your wife to want to follow you. Because she's going to have that need of hers met. Women want to be loved. Above just about everything else, they want to feel special. They want to feel important. Men, husbands, listen up. Your wife wants to make, just, just, have, just to feel and to know that you love her, that you're committed to her, that you care about her, that you're not just so busy with everything else that she just means nothing to you. She needs to feel loved. And if she feels loved, it's going to be a lot easier for her to fall into her role of obeying and being submissive to what you're saying to do. And man, if you're a good leader, it's, you know, again, it makes it easier for the wife to submit. And I'm sure it goes, it goes both directions. The better that you are doing at your job, your spouse will have an easier time getting into their, into their role. Now, at 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're going to see some of the younger women, the, the, the God's will for younger women. Look at verse number 14. Now, I know this is also in context, just so you understand. I'm aware of this. 1 Timothy chapter 5 is talking about widows. But this also is, the, for, for the same reason, this is going to apply, I believe, to other women as well. It's not just for the younger widow, widows. Verse number 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. This is the um, this is God's will for women that they ought to, in general, marry, have children, guide the house, keep yourself busy, don't eat the bread of idleness because women, it's a lot easier to get caught up in, in um, being busybodies and get involved in other people's business and doing a lot of backbiting and things like that. But if you're busy at home, you've got a husband, you've got children, you've got work to do then you'll be keeping yourself occupied doing a good thing instead of just getting off into, into all kinds of sin or nonsense. Now, um, I'm not going to turn there for sake of time because there's just, there's too many things. There's too many things to get to in this sermon. But Proverbs chapter 31 describes the virtuous woman. It's a very famous passage. Read that when you get home. Ladies, study that out. Read it. And one of the things that I take away from Proverbs 31 is just how much of a hard worker the virtuous woman is. I mean, she's keeping herself busy. The Bible says that, that she gets up while it's still night, while it's still dark out. She prepares food for her family. And then she's working hard all day. She's making clothing. She's get going shopping. She's getting everything done. She's working in her own vineyard. She's, she's, she's helping the house to be run. And then in the evening, she still stays up. It says her candle goeth not out by night. Why? Because she's working, working, working. She's keeping busy. She's not sitting on the couch. She's not just eating by bonbons and and just you know whatever she's she's doing work because the bread of idol everyone needs to watch out for the bread of idleness for just just not having things to do that is when sin comes in when you just have nothing to do don't know what you're going to do you know the bible says that, that the heart of man is wicked 
and you open yourself up to just yeah, whatever whatever is just going to come out of your heart then who knows where you're going to end up keep yourself busy keep yourself on 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 task and on schedule again that's that's another sermon for another day but men need to provide for their own household. 1 Timothy 5, verse number 8, the Bible says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is an unbeliever. So think about that, men, what the Bible is saying. If you're not providing for your own family, I mean, especially those just of your own household, if you're not going out and providing for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. It's a pretty important job. Make sure your family is taken care of. Men, that responsibility is falling on your shoulders. And just because you're in charge, you don't say, oh, well, I'm going to send my wife off to work so she can make more money. No, that's your job. You're supposed to be making the money. You're supposed to be uh, in charge at home. Because I'll tell you this, too. If, if you send your wife off to work, you say, but you don't understand our financial situation. Look, I understand the Bible. I understand God's word. And I understand this much, that if you want to have a, a, a godly household where you're actually in charge, it's going to be a lot harder telling your wife how you're going to spend the money that she's going off and working, working for and sweating for. It's a lot harder to be in charge that way. But when you're the one that's earning the income and you're the one doing you have a lot, it's, it's a lot easier job to determine where the finances are going to be going in your household. And that's just a fact. I mean, that's just truth. It's going to be a lot harder for the wife to try to fit into that submissive role when she's just been working and slaving all day and then she comes home and it's like, oh, you're going to buy what? It's, just a, it's going to be your natural response to, to, to not be the one in charge when she's working for all the money. So just keep that in mind. Turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I know we're going back and forth here between men and women and husbands and wives especially. But I mentioned earlier that, that husbands are not only supposed to provide physically for their family as we saw there that you know, if you don't provide for your own house you're, you denied the faith you're worse than an infidel. That's providing for the physical needs of your family, but you're also a spiritual leader. And 1 Corinthians 14 also demonstrates another difference between men and women in general, and especially when it comes to spiritual things. Look at verse number 34. The Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches. So again, we're talking about gender roles. We're talking about being a peculiar people, right? Well, the world's going to look at us being very peculiar and say, what, you mean, you mean you only allow men to speak in the church and not women? You got that right. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. I don't want there to be any confusion or doubt about this. Why? Because the Bible says, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak. They don't have permission to speak in church. You say, well, what about the singing? What about, you know... Look, we all sing praises unto the Lord. That's fine. We all hang around before church, after church, and, and everyone can speak. But you know what this is talking about? This is talking about the teaching time when God's word is being taught. And we get that from the context here. Let's keep reading. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything... Let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So as the church comes together and hears God's word preached, sometimes you'll hear amen, right? You know who should be saying amen or that's good or being in agreement and voicing their opinion on the sermon? It's the men. Sometimes maybe someone will add something or, or maybe don't catch something or, or ask a, a, you know, some type of a question. You know who that ought to be? It's men. And it's saying that the women are to keep silence in the churches. The Bible, look, I didn't write the Bible, but it says that it's a shame for women to speak in the church. I didn't write the Bible, but I believe the Bible. I didn't write the Bible, but as the pastor of this church, I am going to teach and we're going to follow what the Bible says to the best of our ability here. And you know what that does? That's going to make us look peculiar or strange to the world. And that's fine. 
And that's what we're talking about today. We believe in being a peculiar people, being different. Why? Because we obey every word of God. We don't pick and choose. Oh, well, yeah, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not kill anybody. I'm not going to rape. I'm not going to steal. But then throw out everything that the Bible says about husbands and wives and women keeping silent. We don't pick and choose. We believe all of it. And by believing all of it, embracing all of it, that's what's going to make us a peculiar people. And that's who God has called us to be. He's called us out to be separate. He's called us out to be a peculiar people. I'll close on this. 1 Peter chapter 3. Turn if you go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Men have characteristics. God has designed man. He's created man in his own image. Men ought to be strong. You ought to be able to show strength physically as well as spiritually. Look, guys, your wife, not only should she not be the spiritual leader of the household, as I mentioned earlier, if she knows more about the Bible than you do, you need to study up. But she ought not to be able to kick your butt either. All right? You, you ought to be the, the physical man of your house. I mean... Hopefully that's not a problem. It doesn't look like it's a problem for anyone here, but I'll tell you what. You need to be the man. You need to be strong. You need to be in charge. That is a, that is a, a, a godly characteristic for men to have, to be strong. Be strong physically. Be strong spiritually. Be a leader. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't be able to never make up your mind about something. Again, it's going to be a lot harder for your wife to be in obedience and to follow you as a leader if you can never make up your mind about things. Make a decision and stick with it. That's what a leader does. It's okay to be wrong sometimes. You're going to be wrong sometimes. No one's ever perfect. And wives, understand that your husbands will be wrong sometimes. But you're still following your husband. You're staying together as one flesh. You're on the same team. You're the same person, the same body, as it were. The Bible says these two should be one flesh. You're, you're together. You're unified. And men ought to have wisdom and integrity. Now we're going to see some feminine characteristics from 1 Peter chapter 3. Because women also are to be hard workers and not to be idle. But one of the, thing, one of the characteristics that God has designed women with is being quiet and being modest. 1 Peter 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Again, we're seeing the same thing. That subjection means you're in obedience. Because he's in charge. Be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, I'm going to pause right here real quick because you say, Pastor Bruce, why are you bringing this up so much? Why, why do you keep on emphasizing that? The, I know, look, the wife's supposed to be in submission to her husband. I get it. You've said it already. Well, the reason why I keep saying it, one, is because we keep reading it in the Bible. I think God knows that this is a problem. It's going to be a problem oftentimes. And it's definitely a problem in our culture today. Because Satan's been at work trying to turn everything upside down. And to get everything backwards from what Scripture actually says. So I am going to keep on repeating it. As much as it's in Scripture, I'm going to say the same thing. But I'll tell you what. This hasn't always been such a weird, peculiar thing. In this country, yeah, a hundred years ago or less, it was not that abnormal for the man to be in charge, for the man to be going to work, for the woman to be a housewife, to be at home and taking care of children. That was normal. But you know what? That means there were other things going on that if you're following God's law would make you peculiar. But this was normal. And everything I'm saying right now, this isn't some brand new thing. Oh, you're just insane. No. We just believe in a timeless book. We believe in God's Word. Whether it's in season or out of season, we're going to believe it. And we're going to accept it. And we're going to follow it. Let's keep reading here in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're almost done. Verse number 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, who's adorning? This is talking about dress. And we're going to get into that more tonight. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy, look at the holy women also. These are women as being good examples. Women that had an ornament. They were, they were um, 
adorned with a meek and a quiet spirit, which the Bible says that in God's eyes is of great value. That's of great price. So women, you want to be looked on as having great value in God's eyes, as something that's precious, is if you have a meek and a quiet spirit. Not a loud mouth. Not someone is always trying to run the show and tell everyone else what to do and, and tell your husband what to do. If you have an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, in God's eyes, that is of great price. For after this manner also, the, the old time, uh, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Again, I'm not just bringing this up over and over again. We keep reading this over and over again in the Bible. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. We could go on and on, literally. I mean, there's, there's so many verses. There's so much that the Bible talks about with men and with women. And it's been under attack for so long in our culture and, and across the world. The family's being destroyed. We need to stand as a light and say, you know what? I believe this book. I believe God's word. I don't care if you make fun of me for it. I don't care what you say about it. I don't care if you want to make a law against me. I don't care if you want to arrest me. This is what I believe. This is the truth. And I'm not going to change what I believe because of what anybody says. I'm going to stick with God's word. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this clear instruction and clear truth from your word. God, I pray that you would please help us to be that light shining. God, I pray that you please help us to be good examples set forth for others to be able to look upon. And I know none of us are perfect, dear Lord, but, but help us all to love your word enough to, to institute the changes that need to be made in our own lives for husbands, for wives, for men, for women, that men would be more masculine the way that you designed them to be and women would be more feminine the way that you designed them to be. Lord, help us to be good Christians, good role models, good examples of people who follow your words, people who love your words and... and have them in place in their life, dear God. Help us to um, just edify one another in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation that, that is full of darkness and that is trying to obscure the truth on this matter. Lord, help us to hold this truth fast and not to be discouraged by any uh, resistance or oppression that we might receive from trying to be a peculiar people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.